Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, Dr. Gowan here to give you a lecture on the autonomic nervous system. So, uh, sorry for the unusual format. Dr. Lake had some family members she had to attend to and I wasn't planning on lecturing it uh, this year, but um, it looks like I am. So we're recording it and you'll watch this whenever you want to. So um, it's a first for us. So, uh, so today what we're going to do is the autonomic nervous system. I'm also going to do the central nervous system lectures, uh, I believe, in a couple weeks, and I will be doing those remotely as well and pre-recording them um, just because of the way my schedule works uh, and when the class is. So uh, hopefully that works for you guys. Um, so the nervous system and the central nervous system, they're kind of fun lectures to do. There's some things in the slides that won't be on the exam, and Dr. Leg will sort of probably go through and emphasize things that you need for the exam. I do mention some of the herbal stuff or some of the natural stuff in passing. I think it's nice to include that in the context, but uh, she will let you know if that's testable or not. Um, some of the slides, it should more or less work with the textbook that you have. There may be extra things on the slides uh, that you won't need to know for the exam, um, but um, she'll give you a little more description on that. So. With the autonomic nervous system, um, we're going to be talking about mainly the uh, sympathetic, parasympathetic, uh, and the somatic nervous system to some degree. Some of these uh, systems that we're going to talk about aren't that important from a drug standpoint. Um, some of the receptors that we're going to go through, uh, but we'll get into that more in detail in a second sort of my goal is I think it's nice to know the basic mechanism of action of how these various receptors and neurotransmitters work in the body um, and sort of what happens when you stimulate or when you inhibit these various receptors. Also, uh, it's important to know the drug classes that are associated with the different systems, what kind of conditions you're using, you would use these drugs to treat. Uh, also, you should be able to deduce some common side effects uh, from the drugs and maybe what some of the contraindications are. So when it comes to the on and on nervous system, we've already covered a little bit of this in physiology, but the main uh, neurotransmitters involved with this are going to be epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then also uh, acetylcholine. And uh, going through and looking at, these are some little images to describe each one. When it comes to the sympathetic nervous system, you've got you've got adrenergic receptors in the body. And there's basically there's more than four they've discovered now, but there's four main ones that we're going to focus on. And these are the receptors that epinephrine and norepinephrine can interact with and have an effect. Now, uh, just as an aside, when it comes to acetylcholine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, they also have an effect in the central nervous system. So in the brain, they have different effects there than they would have in the periphery uh, in the body. But So uh, the sympathetic nervous system, this is going to be the main fight or flight response um, and it involves adrenergic receptors and those receptors are on various uh, target organs and glands in the body. You've got the parasympathetic nervous system where they have Muscarinic receptors are the main types of receptors on the target organs and glands, and this is going to be mainly involved with digestive function, uh, but also there's going to be an effect on the cardiovascular system, on lungs, and some other areas as well. And then finally, the somatic nervous system, which involves the muscles, there's nicotinic receptors right on the muscles that acetylcholine binds to and has an effect. Now, the in interesting thing about nicotinic receptors is you also have them at the synaptic ganglion. So um, all wings of the nervous system, the sympathetic, parasympathetic, somatic nervous system, and even the central nervous system has nicotinic receptors in it. So by uh, taking something like nicotine, it will have a, a stimulatory effect on all aspects of the nervous system. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So to start off with the sympathetic nervous system, I think most of you know the main effects that occurs when you stimulate it. So the main goal uh, of the sympathetic nervous system is to acutely make you 
better at fighting off a bear or running away from you know some threat. And everyone here, I'm sure, has experienced the effects of this. Uh, the main effects it has would be, for example, in your eyes, it causes your pupils to dilate. And when your pupils dilate, it allows you to take in more light so you can see, uh, you can basically see better large objects moving around like you know, creatures running towards you uh, or trees that you're trying to avoid. So that's kind of the idea with why it causes pupil dilation. And um, in addition to that, because you're busy running or fighting, you need to breathe more. So there's going to be bronchodilation occurring. You're going to have an increase in your heart rate. The heart's going to contract stronger. Uh, some capillaries and arteries will constrict and dilate depending on where you want to put the blood. So you want more blood going towards muscle, heart, and brain. Um, you're going to have a decrease in urine output. And you're going to be sweating more as well. So that's the main effect. And when um, when it comes to the adrenergic nervous system, you do have receptors in um, the adrenal glands and also on various target organs like the eyes, the lungs, the arteries uh, that, uh, when they're stimulated, have the desired effect. Now, there are things called sympathomimetics, and these are substances that mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So, the main neurotransmitters that are going to have this effect in the body are going to be norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. And if you look at the structure of them on the left hand side, these are all classified as what are called catecholamines. A catecholamine, uh, if you see that pink phenol group there with the two OH groups, those are the catechols. And these compounds um, uh, are classified as catecholamines. And that has some importance that we'll discuss later on. Now, when you're looking at various drugs that interact with the sympathetic nervous system, uh, look at the ones on the right, things like ephedrine, um, amphetamines, uh, cocaine, these all have an effect on the sympathetic nervous system very similar to what might happen if you're taking small amounts of norepinephrine or dopamine. And we'll talk about those in a second. Now, when it comes to drugs, there are drugs that act as mimickers of the sympathetic nervous system or ones that block the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathomimetics stimulate it, sympatholytics, lytic or lysis means to break apart, so they basically suppress the sympathetic nervous system. Now one of the things, just to understand the biochemistry behind what's going on, when you have epinephrine or uh, something else that binds to the adrenergic receptors in the body, these are coupled to G proteins. Uh, the G protein migrates over, binds to uh, a receptor called adenylase cyclase, or an enzyme, that converts ATP to cyclic AMP, that's a CAMP. And this is an intracellular messenger that has, uh, is responsible for communicating whatever those sympathetic effects are. Now in the body, there's another enzyme called phosphodiesterase, and what it's responsible for is to inhibiting uh, the sympathetic effects by breaking down the cyclic AMP. And this sort of inactivates the cyclic AMP so that you're not uh, propagating uh, the effects of the epinephrine. So when the cyclic AMP levels are elevated, it basically causes smooth muscles to relax, causes certain muscles to contract, uh, increases the availability of sugar, uh, helps to break down fat. So those are just a few things that, that occur with that. Now, with regards to those receptors, we have adrenergic receptors uh, in different places in the body. Now, this is sort of a dumbed-down, simplified version of what's going on. Things are always more complicated, but it's nice for the sake of being able to memorize things uh, to remember that there's four main receptors. And when it comes to the alpha receptors, uh, these receptors are typically on, the way that I remember it, on the tubes of the body. And what I mean by that is, um, they affect mainly blood and circulation uh, by working on capillaries or arteries and things like that. And they also have an effect on urine output and the urinary system. And so when you stimulate these, you primarily get vasoconstriction going on and some smooth muscle constriction going on. And so drugs that act as agonists will stimulate these receptors. And generally speaking, uh, decongestants uh, that you might spray in your nostrils uh, 
uh, are basically will target these. And hypertension, uh, there's one hypertensive class of drugs that also targets these, um, and it's a bit of a uh, contradictory reason, uh, but we'll talk about that later on. Normally when you cause vasoconstriction or you stimulate the alpha receptors, you'll have uh, an elevation of blood pressure, but there is one thing that through a feedback mechanism, it actually reduces blood pressure. Um, now, something that blocks the alpha receptors uh, could be used to lower blood pressure uh, by causing vasodilation and also it could be used to increase urine output and to relax certain sphincters that are involved in um, urination around the prostate and so it could also be used for BPH or enlarged prostates uh, in men. Um, now the beta receptors are typically found in the heart and the lungs and the way that I remember this is beta 1 corresponds to the fact that you have one heart and beta 2 corresponds to the fact that you have two lungs. So beta 1 receptors are primarily going to be targeted for things involving the cardiovascular system. And so when you stimulate a beta 1 receptor, you're going to increase cardiac output and also cause an elevation indirectly with blood pressure. And so if you block these, you're going to slow down the cardiac output and potentially lower blood pressure. And so they would be used primarily for conditions like cardiac arrhythmias where you want to slow down the heart and get a more regular rhythm or for people suffering from angina and hypertension. Now the beta-2 receptors, um, basically when you stimulate beta-2 receptors, you're going to have things like bronchodilation occurring uh, and you're going to have a relaxation of the smooth muscles uh, in the trachea uh, and the bronchioles um, and this will allow more oxygen to flow into the area. So an agonist of this would be used primarily for things like asthma, COPD, bronchitis, um, where there's impaired oxygen flow or reduced oxygen flow into the area. So this will help uh, with that. And <clears throat> one of the, yes, that's enough for now. So moving on to the next slide. Um, Sympathomimetics, as we mentioned, will bind the adrenergic receptors to sort of have a uh, mimicking effect on stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. So these could be used both from a drug standpoint or from a herbal standpoint for things like asthma, seasonal allergies where you want to have a decongestant for weight loss because they do stimulate weight loss, although that's a little bit uh, controversial and maybe not necessarily safe. Also, you might use some for things like concentration, but that's more related to not so much the autonomic nervous system, but when we talk more about the central nervous system. And so examples of herbal and some drug examples would be things like ephedra, cocaine, types of amphetamines, which can be abused and used recreationally or for um, off-label indications like weight loss, or uh, they could be used for other conditions involving the central nervous system for concentration uh, and uh, also for some respiratory issues. Now drugs that inhibit the sympathetic nervous system are often referred to as sympatholytics and these drugs, the lies means to break apart uh, and so this is going to inhibit the sympathetic tone and it's going to have more of a calming effect, lower blood, lower blood pressure and decreased cardiac output. Um, so probably the archetypal sympathomimetic or sympath, um, stimulant to the sympathetic nervous system it's going to be something like epinephrine. So if someone has an allergic reaction to something, you give them a shot of an EpiPen, what it basically does is it stimulates all receptors, all the adrenergic receptors in the body, uh, both the alpha ones and the beta, uh, alpha receptors and the beta receptors to uh, cause basically wide uh, acting effects on the sympathetic nervous system. So taking a shot of adrenaline, I'm sure everyone here is experience some sort of uh, adrenaline rush at some point in their life and you'll notice that your heart starts pounding, your your vision changes, you might develop a little bit of anxiety, you get a rush of strength um, internally, uh, your blood pressure has gone up, there's changes in your blood sugar levels, um, your breathing becomes easier. Uh, so that's the main effects and primarily um, you don't want to use epinephrine 
for very many things because there's so many side effects associated with it. So epinephrine or EpiPens are primarily reserved for situations where it's a life-threatening thing, whether that be anaphylactic shock, um, that would be the main condition, but you might use it for cardiac arrest or sepsis where there's a severe infection in the body and everyone and the patient's blood pressure drops dangerously low. And in theory, you could use it for, for an acute asthma attack uh, when there's no other drugs available. So it could be used for that, but there would be some significant side effects like the uh, increased heart rate and, and palpitations. And usually there's some anxiety that's and irritation and irritability that's associated with uh, epinephrine. So the reason why you don't want to use it is because it's going to have all these side effects related to the cardiovascular, the nervous, uh, and also potentially to the respiratory tract. So, so generally speaking, one thing with epinephrine, if you get a shot of the adrenaline, what you may have noticed, and I remember driving my car once and I almost got in a car accident, uh, you get that instant shot of adrenaline, uh, and it, it takes a fraction of a second to get released. Your uh, coordination and your reflexes are amplified, and it lasts for about five, maybe uh, a few minutes, and then afterwards it stops quite quickly. Like The effects of this... Um, uh, is reversible and, 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 and is relatively short acting, a few minutes and maybe 10 minutes later you're still kind of like trembling a little bit, a little bit in shock, but eventually it goes away after after minutes I would say. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that norepinephrine and epinephrine and also, well, norepinephrine, epinephrine and also dopamine, they're all inhibited by enzymes called codical catechol o methyltransferase and the monoamine oxidase enzymes. We'll talk about those a little bit more in the central nervous system. Uh, but there are two enzymes that work on them, and that's why they have such a short half-life in the body. Now, just quickly, we're going to talk about a couple herbs that have uh, natural products that have sympathomimetic effects. Uh, ephedrine and a pseudoephedrine, and also sinephrine. These are substances that interact with the adrenergic receptors in the body. Uh, and if you look structurally, ephedrine and sinephrine, it looks very similar. Now, ephedrine comes from the herb ephedra. It's still used, ephedra and pseudo, or ephedrine and pseudoephedrine are still used in sinus and cold medication because it acts as a decongestant primarily. Um, they also have uh, some anti allergic properties, so they can be used that. And they're available over the counter um, in non-prescription medications. Now the herb ephedra has been used for centuries for the same indications, colds and flus. Um, bitter orange is the same orange that's used to make marmalade and it contains the sinephrine and structurally and functionally it behaves very very similar, almost identical to ephedra. Uh, it may have a better safety profile and structurally it's, it's almost the same. Um, now one of the ways that these guys work is in addition to binding directly to the adrenergic receptors, it may indirectly elevate the levels of norepinephrine in the body uh, from the storage vesicles within uh, nerve cells. So there is a direct and indirect way that it can have an effect. It may also have an effect on dopamine levels to some degree as well, and that may be one of the reasons why ephedra can be a little bit of a habit-forming thing if people are taking it regularly. Um, so not too dangerous, but a, a little bit of an issue. Um, generally speaking, the main side effects associated with these things would be uh, stimulation of the cardiovascular system, causing an elevation of blood pressure, uh, and also it can maybe aggravate angina. Uh, if someone has anxiety, it wouldn't be good for that as well. So you'd want to watch out for that. Um, now, as we mentioned before, when you're looking at uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and also dopamine, they are what are classified as the catecholamines. And that means the enzyme called catechol-O-methyltransferase will inhibit uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Now, ephedrine and sinephrine are not catecholamines, so what that means is that they're not inhibited, inhibited by that enzyme. And because they aren't structurally identical, there's two things that occurs. One, they're not as strong as epinephrine and norepinephrine. And two, 
they have a longer half-life in the body because they're not broken down by the same mechanism because they lack the structure required to break them down by the catecholomethyltransferase enzyme. So, in general, they have a shorter, um, sorry, they have a longer half-life in the body. So, instead of an EpiPen that only is going to have an effect for minutes, epinephrine and cinephrine could have an effect for hours and the amplitude is reduced so it's not as intense so basically instead of being high and short it's broad and uh, and 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 not as intense so certainly a little bit safer maybe not as effective if you had to deal with something like acutely but you probably could use these for um, similar conditions like even for anaphylaxis if you didn't have an EpiPen that would be my second choice for sure. Here's an image of bitter orange on the left hand side uh, and then ephedra on the right. Uh, both of these have gotten a lot of criticism for their use in weight loss mainly because if you weigh 400 pounds uh, you probably have elevated blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar issues and if you're just too lazy to change your diet or you didn't want to change your diet and you just took a whole bunch of ephedra to lose weight, uh, you could get yourself into trouble. Even in young people, they had some underlying cardiovascular issue or if you took a bunch of ephedra or bitter orange and you combine that with some other stimulant like caffeine in high amounts, uh, that could cause some uncomfortable side effects and potentially death. There's not a lot of deaths associated with these, but the FDA has basically banned them for weight loss, at least for the ephedra. Bitter orange, it might still be available. Uh, it does seem relatively safe. Herbal Graham had an article on it that's worth looking at, um, at the safety of it, but still, when it comes to weight loss, you don't want to be giving supplements. You want to be focusing on the diet and exercise. Um, moving on to another sympathomimetic that certainly one of my favorites is caffeine. And if you look at caffeine, caffeine is it's classified as a methylxanthine. So a lot of the other things like theobromine, which is found in chocolate, or theophylline that's found in uh, tea, these are all classified as methylxanthines, and these basically um, act as sympathomimetics sympath through two mechanisms. One, they inhibit an enzyme in the body called adenosine, and adenosine, um, that's the same molecule that when you have ATP that gets released when you burn off, burn, break down a whole bunch of sugar, Adenosine AMP is, is a, uh, one of the products that gets released from it, and it binds to the adenosine re uh, receptors in the body and has a calming effect. So normally if you go to the gym, you work out a whole bunch, uh, you might feel kind of sleepy afterwards, and that's because your body's released all this adenosine, so it has a calming effect. And uh, So these adenosine receptors can help with anxiety, can slow down the heart rate, and has some other positive effects. So coffee... Uh, and the caffeine and basically inhibits these enzymes and causes an, a stimulatory effect. Uh, so, and that can also cause a, a release of uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine in the body. The second thing that um, these adenosine receptors do, or these uh, methylxanthines do, is they inhibit the phosphodiesterase enzyme. And so, what they do is they inhibit the breakdown of cyclic AMP. And if you look at caffeine on the left and then adenosine on the right, you can see how similar they are in structure. So if you remember back to this diagram, looking at the caffeine on the right-hand side, it inhibits that phosphodiesterase enzyme, so it prevents the breakdown of the cyclic AMP, which is the intracellular messenger, and so it causes an elevation um, and prolongation of the cyclic AMP and all the sympathetic effects that are associated with it. So, if you've ever wondered how coffee works, there you go. Uh, I'm going to skip over that, but you have that in your slides, just another way of explaining how it works. Now, there are some other sympathomimetic drugs that are worth talking about, or herbs that are worth talking about. A lot of the pungent herbs, like cayenne, ginger, usual little garlic, uh, indirectly they can have a sympathetic effect in the body. Uh, I'm going to skip over this, uh, but certainly if you take a lot of spicy food, you'll notice that it you start sweating, uh, it can act as a decongestion, your airways open up, your nose might start to run a little bit, um, it can have an effect on circulation, 
so these are kind of indirect uh, pungent herbs that can have some stimulatory effects uh, in the body. Uh, a few other thermogenic plants that are worth mentioning. So when it comes to weight loss and burning down, um, weight loss and burning fat, things that are thermogenic help to release energy and break down the fat and stimulate uh, the oxidation of the fat. So some herbs that do this, ephedra and bitter orange I've already mentioned, I wouldn't say those are safe ones to use, but things like green tea contain um, ECGC and that's been shown to have some benefits on weight loss, so does cayenne, so consuming cayenne and ginger can both help with weight loss. Now, these are not uh, magical cures for, for obesity. They might help someone lose a couple pounds, but again, when you see people marketing uh, certain herbal products being amazing, miraculous drugs or herbs for weight loss, they do help a little bit. I would say probably ephedra is the most miraculous, but there's too many side effects associated with it. So I think telling someone to eat more ginger, cayenne, and green tea is not a bad thing to do if they're overweight, um, but you can't ignore uh, limiting the carbs in their diet. Now when it comes to pharmaceutical drugs, um, we're going to discuss the adrenergic receptors and the blockers for this, and, uh, the, fir and the agonists and the blockers. So the first one we're going to talk about is an alpha-1 agonist. Uh, now, probably I'm not supposed to show products on here. Uh, oxymetazolin is a drug that basically acts as an agonist for the alpha-1 uh, receptors in the body, and it also has an effect on the alpha-2 receptors in the body. Um, it's primarily used as a nasal spray to help with uh, seasonal allergies or sinusitis. So you spray it in the nose and it causes basal constriction. The way that it works is when you have nasal congestion, it's not necessarily phlegm that, phlegm that you have in your nose. It could just be a little bit of edema in the sinuses. And so what happens is if you have some kind of irritant in the nose, um, various things get released including histamine that causes the capillaries to become leakier and then water flows into the interstitial space and um, kind of causes the area to become inflamed causing edema. So kind of like if you have swelling of your ankles uh, where there's a lot of edema, uh, the same thing can happen in your nose. Now the way these drugs work is it causes vasoconstriction so that the capillaries uh, constrict and become less leaky and as a result the area just sort of dries up and so you don't have that bogginess. So if you have a nasal congestion, blowing your nose really hard doesn't always get rid of that puffiness, that, that swelling, that nasal congestion because it's not because there's phlegm in there or, or some kind of bug in there. It can just be that it's water in between the cells. So the benefit of doing of using these uh, alpha-1 agonists is that uh, they really do work and they act as a good decongestion. The disadvantage um, is that if you use it long term, you become dependent on it so that if you try to discontinue it, you'll get a rebound congestion, nasal congestion, so it's kind of addictive in that way where you want to end up taking it all the time. Uh, the other possible thing is that if you're applying it frequently all the time, it could cause severe basal constriction and decrease uh, profusion of the cells with nutrients and, and, and everything that they need and it could cause death ischemia to some of the cells. Uh, just as an aside note, if you think about people who are doing a lot of cocaine, they experience a lot of the same sort of effects uh, locally in the nose because the cocaine also has a vasoconstricting effect like this and sometimes people's the septum in the nose will rot because they've overused it. Well, I guess you shouldn't be using cocaine anyways, but they've used so much of it that um, the cells aren't getting the nutrients they need and they just die off and cause bad things locally. So um, so although these are really um, effective, I generally don't recommend using these with people. Now moving on, so that's the alpha-1 agonist. The alpha-2 agonist, um, normally when you stimulate an alpha agonist, or sorry, normally when you stimulate an alpha receptor in the body, uh, intuitively I would think it's going to cause 
constriction of the artery or whatever it may be and elevate blood pressure. Uh, but there is one drug, co drug called clonidine which does the opposite of what you would expect. It actually causes a lowering of blood pressure. Now this drug is an unusual drug. It's not used primarily for blood pressure um, because there are more effective drugs. Um, but it's sometimes given to people with things like Tourette's syndrome. Also with opiate withdrawal, uh, it can counter some of the agitation uh, associated with some stimulants because it does have a bit of a calming effect. And the way that this drug works is um, it has minimal effect on the adrenergic receptors in the periphery because it's able to cross the blood-brain barrier. That's what BBB is. And so there are alpha-2 receptors within the central nervous system that when um, the clonidine binds to it, it basically stimulates us and tells the brain, okay, we got enough norepinephrine floating around in the body, so stop releasing more from the adrenal glands. So through a feedback mechanism, it tells the body to release less of the um, uh, uh, norepinephrine. And as a result, because there's less norepinephrine floating around, uh, the sympathetic tone decreases and blood pressure goes down. And it also has the effects, as we described, uh, on mood uh, as well. So the main benefits of this is um, lowers blood pressure, can decrease some of the anxiety associated with drug withdrawals. Um, the side effects are going to be fatigue because you're decreasing sympathetic tone, dry mouth, uh, and one of the cautions you have to have if you were to discontinue this abruptly, you will see an elevation and in, in like a rebound hypertension. So, um, so this is a weird kind of drug. It's not a, it's not one of the most important drugs out there. Uh, you'll see it used for some unusual things, but it's worth knowing what it does. So, uh, that's an example of an alpha two agonist. Now the sympatholytics, so the alpha one antagonists, these drugs are usually referred to as alpha blockers. So if something is an alpha antagonist or an alpha blocker, it's the same thing. Um, these are used primarily for blood pressure, uh, sorry, these are used primarily for benign prostate hyperplasia, enlarged prostate, and it's maybe a second or third line drug used for blood for uh, high blood pressure. Uh, so if someone came in with an, large, an older man coming with a large prostate and they have blood pressure issues, they may use it for both of those. Uh, most of these drugs end in zosin, so like things like doxazosin um, is usually the um, an alpha blocker. So usually when I try to make, if I'm trying to memorize drug names or drug classes, I usually look at the endings and see if I can find any parallels. I don't remember, I really have a terrible mem memory for memorizing the drugs, and there's an awful lot of them. So I usually try to understand what the drug class does, uh, and if there's any sort of easy ways to remember uh, the classes as a whole. And sometimes drugs will have similar endings to them that makes it easier. So the way that the alpha blockers, alpha-1 blockers work is um, the receptors are on both um, the arteries and also on the smooth muscles involved with circulation and, and urination. And so when you inhibit these, It'll cause dilation of the smooth muscles, and so that could cause lowering of blood pressure, or <clears throat> or it may cause um, re relaxation of the sphincters around the prostate to help men with BPH urinate better. Um, so they're pretty safe. The main issues with the safety with this is one: if you're lowering blood pressure and someone already has low blood pressure, they could feel faint. So making sure that if you added this drug on to someone who um, was also taking other blood pressure, blood pressure medication, uh, there will be an accumulative effect there. And then the second thing is that it can cause uh, retrograde ejaculation. So when men ejaculate, normally the semen is supposed to flow out, but if you don't have that sphincter tight around the prostate, it can backflow into the bladder and cause some irritation there. So um, those are just, so if you had someone coming in with they started this medication, they have developed some new uh, urinary symptoms, then uh, those would be the questions to ask. Now, another sympatholytic groups that we're going to talk about are the beta blockers. 
and you've got the beta-1 blockers, um, and these are referring to substances that basically work on the cardiovascular system. So, uh, propanolol is the archetypal, probably one of the first ones that were developed, and since then, they've refined them and made them more, uh, have a higher affinity for the beta-1 uh, receptors in the body, and the problem with a lot of these drugs is they do have some affinity for the beta-2 receptors. So when you're creating a drug, you want it to target the heart, but not have the negative effects on the respiratory system. So as an aside, if you think about what happens if you were to slow down the heart rate uh, and inhibit all the beta blockers, what's going to happen there, if you look at the diagram on the right, cardiac output goes down, but also you have basal constriction occurring and difficulties with breathing. So giving someone a beta blocker who has asthma would be contraindicated with some of the first generation drugs. The second generations are more specific, so they seem to have less side effects associated with uh, the respiratory system, but you still want to watch out for that. Um, now one little hint I find with the beta blockers is I would say most of them, if not all of them, uh, no, most of them, not all of them, end in OL, OL. And so that's one way you can, if you see something that ends in that, it just trigger it's a, it's a beta blocker. Uh, the primary indications for this is it's not used as a first-line therapy for lowering blood pressure, uh, but it's it's there for sure. Um, uh, it's definitely you know maybe a, a second choice, or but it's primarily used for things like arrhythmias, angina. Uh, it can be used topically for glaucoma to help uh, decrease. Uh, um, the pressure in, in the eye, uh, and then hypertension is usually more as a secondary indication uh, for it, uh, or as a side benefit to it. Uh, so we described all the mechanism there. Side effects, as I mentioned, you can get bronchospasms or reduced um, air exchange, and this is more of an issue if they're not selective. Um, because of the effects on the cardiovascular system, it can decrease cir circulation, lower blood pressure, decrease cardiac output. So if someone had something like congestive heart failure and they're taking this drug, it's going to make the heart wor work less effectively, and that's going to be an issue. Uh, fatigue, dizziness because of the less blood floating around in the system. There are some other unusual symptoms that are not related to uh, the cardiovascular or the respiratory system, including uh, most drugs will cause some nausea and di diarrhea as a potential side effect. Um, they can also cause erectile dysfunction, which is something that's important. So if you have a man coming in with um, erectile dysfunction and difficult difficulties maintaining an, ere maintaining an erection, and he's taking a whole slew of drugs, it's worth looking at the drugs to see if any of them are the cause of that. Uh, finally, another thing that's interesting is that for some reason, some of these drugs will affect melatonin levels. And so a side effect could be sleep disturbances. So that's worth um, ruling out. If someone comes in, they're taking medications and they have some complaints, make sure you look at the time of when they started the drugs and then quickly glance at the side effects to see if there's any possibility the drugs could be causing that effect. Because it makes it very difficult to treat if, um, if you don't know what the cause is. Now, beta-2 agonists, these are going to be some pathomimetics uh, that stimulate the beta-2 receptors in the uh, respiratory tract. And so these drugs are used primarily for uh, asthma, COPD, emphysema, things like that where you have reduced um, breathing and air exchange. And so salbutamol uh, is one of the main drugs. Often they're given as a puffer. And the benefits of taking it as a puffer is that you have a more specific effect on the respiratory tract and you get less of an effect on the cardiovascular system because these aren't entirely selective just for the, for the beta-2 receptors. There will be some effects on the beta-1 receptors. Um, so when you take a puffer like that, it typically kicks in almost immediately um, and then lasts for several hours. And so that's positive. 
and because you're doing it locally and you're inhaling it, you tend to get less uh, side effects in general. There is a potential, because they act as some pathomimetics, there is a potential to have some effects on other uh, parts of the body, including things like insomnia or anxiety, because it has a bit of a stimulant effect. It could cause some tremors, just like if you take too much adrenaline, you'll get a bit of a, your hands will tremor and shake a bit. And then any some of the issues related to the cardiovascular system. And you can deduce most of those symptoms. You, you think of what happens if you sim stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, and if someone takes too much of a substance, even if it's taken topically uh, or has a local effect, if they take enough of it, it will kind of get into the system and have some effects in other areas as well. Um, now, reserpine is a drug derived from a herb called Rewolfia. And it's worth mentioning a little bit, this is not a drug or a herb that gets used very often. I, I've used it only once or twice in my career, um, back when uh, I think I was a student in fourth year. And then we weren't allowed to use it for a while. I think we are now. I don't really know what's going on with the board. This is a really, really effective drug for lowering blood pressure. Um, but there's a lot of side effects, so it's not something that we use very often. The herb itself has less side effects, um, but it's hard to get, it's just, it's hard to know what we're allowed to do right now with the board. I haven't actually checked, but I think we're allowed to, but you have to be careful with it. Generally speaking, when it comes to lowering blood pressure, though, you always want to start with diet and lifestyle first. I wouldn't jump to this right away. Um, now, reserve being the substance, um, the herb was used historically for high blood pressure, uh, a type of movement disorder called Huntington's chorea and schizophrenia. And the reason why it's used for all those different things is that it depletes, inhibits sympathetic, ter uh, sympathetic tone. It depletes uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and also dopamine in the body. And so this, this slide will probably make more sense after we go through the central nervous system slide. So rather than blocking receptors in the body, it basically uh, blocks the storage of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And as a result, these uh, neurotransmitters are then able to get broken down. And so you decrease the relative amounts of these in the system. So it's quite potent. One of the problems by by depleting dopamine, dopamine can have a uh, hallucinogenic effect in the body in high amounts. So that's one of the reasons why it's been used for uh, psychosis, uh, um, psychotic episodes, and, and schizophrenia in the past. Uh, the main side effects of taking this is because you're depleting norepinephrine dop and uh, epinephrine and dopamine, um, there are going to be some serious side effects associated with it. Now, dopamine itself, you'll talk about later on is involved with uh, depleting dopamine will cause Parkinson-like symptoms, cause some depression, decreased libido, some sexual dysfunction, um, can also affect cardiovascular effects, so uh, that's not good. So reserpine in general, it lowers blood pressure indirectly by depleting the body of the neurotransmitters and a lot of side effects, so it's not really used very often as a drug. It's, um, just as an aside, what's kind of neat about the herb is that Wolfia, the herb, in addition to containing reserpine, which can have all these nasty side effects, it also contains another substance called yohimbine, which has been shown to help with erectile dysfunction and has another a number of benefits to it. So it's kind of neat that the whole herb has uh, less side effects uh, than taking the active reserpine uh, and isolating and taking it alone. So here's a diagram. This is going to make more sense after we do the CNS lecture. But the idea, this is a nerve that takes up the epinephrine or dopamine and um, various neurotransmitters using the transporter there and the pink on the right. A little Pac-Man is the monoamine oxidase enzyme that inhibits these neurotransmitters. Up at the top there, the vesicular monoamine transporter stores uh, the dopamine and epinephrine or epinephrine in the storage vesicles so that it's not able to get broken down. It's kind of like puts a little fence around it. And when you take something like reserpine, what it does is it blocks that transporter, the vesicular monoamine transporter. So as a result, you can't store as much epinephrine and dopamine, and that means it gets broken down and decreases sympathetic tone.
So that's how that works. Now I'm just going to check the clock to make sure that we're not, I want to take a break uh, at half past or so. So the parasympathetic nervous system, um, discussing this, um, this is the main, uh, this is sort of the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. So uh, this is the main uh, part of the nervous system responsible for various things like digestion, uh, there's some effects on reproduction. Uh, what I imagine it, uh, with this parasympathetic nervous system is it sort of, sort of represents what you require when you're sitting on the couch eating like food and watching TV or reading a book. And so um, the main effects that it causes is for the most part opposite of what the sympathetic nervous system does. So it causes pupil constriction and the benefit of, pup of constricting the pupils allows you to focus watch TV or read um, because you're not running away from things or fighting things you don't need as much air exchange going on so there's basically bronchoconstriction that takes place you're trying to conserve energy so you decrease your heart rate and the force of the contractions you increase digestive juices uh, so you're going to see an increase in saliva uh, release of stomach acid, bile, uh, pancreatic enzymes it's going to stimulate the movement of, this, of the bowels, so it stimulates smooth muscle contractions and peristalsis, um, and it also helps promote urination. So those are the main things that happen. Uh, and what's interesting is acetylcholine, in this case, binds to the nicotinic receptors uh, and also to the muscarinic receptors on the target organs. Uh, just really quickly for the biochemistry of this, phospholipidylcholine uses an enzyme called phospholipase D that releases the choline from the cell membranes and there's another enzyme that called choline, choline acetyltransferase that uses vitamin B5 as a cofactor to convert choline into acetylcholine and that's how you get your neurotransmitters. So. Uh, you may have heard of phospholipidylcholine. Um, it's rich in things like soy lecithin, uh, and it's used as a precursor to make your acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. Now, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in the body, uh, and so, like all other neurotransmitters, we have to be able to break it down. So. Enzymes called cholinesterase enzymes or acetylcholinesterase enzymes are responsible for basically cleaving the acetyl group off of the choline molecule uh, and thereby making it inactive. Um, and this is a way that we're able to control the effects of acetylcholine by able, you're able to increase the production and also to break it down if you need to. If you didn't do that, then uh, you could get uh, a lot of the negative side effects and could become dangerous. So what we'll do is we'll go through and look at both the agonist and the antagonist uh, for the parasympathetic nervous system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick little break here just to stop the recording and then I'll be back in two seconds. It won't affect you guys, you'll just see me back in half a second. So I'm just going to, if I can figure out how to stop this, um, I don't know how to stop this. I'm going to just stop it right here. I'll be back in a second. Okay, I'm back. So, what we're going to do now is discuss some of the agonists and antagonists uh, for the sympathetic nervous system. Um, here's a quick little summary chart. It'll make more sense to you in a second, but these are basically substances or drugs that directly or indirectly target um, the various um, uh, receptors in the mus and the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so this is a diagram that basically shows a couple ways 
in general that you can affect the uh, parasympathetic nervous system is if you've got acetylcholine as the main neurotransmitter then what you can do is you can produce a drug that also binds to the muscarinic receptors and acts as an agonist for that receptor and so these are drugs like muscar or substances like muscarine or pilocarpine um, that can do that uh, you can also inhibit the breakdown of uh, acetylcholine therefore making more of it available and that will stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and if you want to uh, inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system then you could take a substance like atropine which is an anticholinergic block those receptors uh, and that will prevent the acetylcholine from binding to it so uh, so the ways that you stimulate it is either you bind directly to the muscarinic receptors or you inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine and if you want to inhibit it then you block those receptors. So the first thing we'll talk about is a muscarinic receptor agonist. Now you may have heard of the fly agaric mushroom. So if you look at um, Alice in Wonderland where you have the caterpillar smoking the hookah on top of a big mushroom that's got uh, that's red with white spots on it. That, that classic fairy tale mushroom is called the fly agaric mushroom. It's uh, an image of it is on the right hand side there. Now the mushroom I'm showing on the right has uh, a yellow cap with white spots on. It's not hasn't quite opened yet. It's a little immature one. That's the variety that grows around here in Algonquin Park. Uh, if you were in the west coast or if you're in Siberia and Asia, it gets the red uh, classic red and white caps on it. Now this mushroom is interesting. It's um, contains a substance called muscarine and muscarine was I guess when they were doing the research was the first substance that they isolated that bound to the bound to the muscarinic receptors and it came from the fly agaric mushroom uh, and so if you were to eat the fly agaric mushroom it would stimulate your muscarinic receptors and the main effects that you're going to experience is going to be increase in digestive function which is going to cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, it's also going to increase um, salivation, uh, tearing as well. And so that's sort of what basically ends up happening. Um, also causes constriction of the pupils. Uh, and so on the left hand side there's a little mnemonic picture. So this is what I don't write out my notes a lot when I'm playing and they're listening to lectures I usually end up just drawing little pictures. I'm not a very good artist but I draw little, little pictures like that. It's just a a way for me to remember, oh yeah, muscarinic receptors, fly agaric mushroom, muscarine, what are the main effects? And there we've got nausea, vomiting going on there, we've got he's crying, he's salivating, there's feces and there's urine on the ground, so that's the effect of stimulating uh, those receptors. Um, so basically when you stimulate the muscarinic receptors, pretty much any gland or uh, organ that can produce or secrete something gets stimulated to make more of it, like your digestive juices, tears, things like that. Uh, and because it stimulates your, your um, uh, smooth muscles in your uh, GI tract, it tends to increase peristalsis, leading to potentially projectile vomiting and diarrhea uh, in extreme cases. Uh, and also a lot of pain, a lot of colicky pain, because when you get an increase in smooth muscles, it can cause discomfort. Now, just for fun and for interest's sake, uh, the reason why the fly agaric mushroom is associated with sort of fairy tales and stuff is because it does also contain a, uh, a hallucinogenic compound which has an effect on GABA receptors in the body. So those same receptors that are involved with drugs like Valium um, and some of these other sedatives, the fly agaric mushroom has a compound that's different than the muscarine that interacts with uh, those receptors and as a result it has a calming effect and it can cause lucid dreaming apparently um, and uh, so it has originally been used by shamans in Siberia. This is not a magic mushroom per se, like it's not the same class. Magic mushrooms interact with serotonin receptors. This is working on GABA system and benzodiazepine receptors. Um, probably not a safe thing to do. I think the problem with it is that you might get a little bit of a mind psychotropic effect, but you're going to end up getting a lot of vomiting and diarrhea, and that would be very unpleasant. So I wouldn't 
really recommend experimenting with these, but they have been used in the past. Um, now, just as another little funny little thing is that um, when you consume this mushroom, your liver breaks down the mu screen quite effectively, and the psychotropic effects, the hallucinogenic properties, are excreted in the urine un, uh, unaffected. So uh, if you don't want to get the nausea and vomiting, you can always just drink the urine if someone's already taken the mushrooms and get the psychotropic effects without getting all the um, negative effects on the digestive system, providing you can stomach the urine. So that's uh, just a fun little tidbit for you. Um, so some, so we know that mus muscarin binds to the muscar muscarinic receptors, but there are also some drugs that bind to the muscarinic receptors as well. Pilocarpine, which is called uh, Japarendi, uh, is a herb that grows in Central and South America. There's different species of this, that's why I said down Pilocarpus species. And these aren't used a lot in medicine, except for uh, when you're trying to cause constriction of the pupil. So it'd be used more by an ophthalmologist. Uh, it could be used for things like glaucoma, where you want to decrease the pressure in the eye by reducing the amount of flow of, uh, of uh, liquid in the eye and so as a topical eye drop uh, it might be used for those types of conditions. The problem if you were to take it orally is you're going to get a major side effect uh, associated with it. Now the main symptoms of, of, uh, of a parasympathomimetic uh, agonist or stimulator is the mnemonic for it is called sludge. And so this is going to be the salivation, the lacrimation, which is the tearing, increased urination, defecation, gastrointestinal upset, and emesis. So you can either do the written mnemonic or you can just remember the little pictures. So on the right-hand side, there you've got a little pile of carpings. So in my mind, I'm like, there's a little carp swimming around in this fish bowl there. And it's full of urine and feces and tears. Uh, and... Uh, vomit and there you go. So that's one way to remember it. Okay. So again, you'll probably never hear of any of your patients ever being on these drugs, but it's I'm ex including them just so you know the context of, of how they fit in and how they work on the nervous system. It's not practical, but it helps understand stuff, I think. Um, now, in addition to directly stimulating the muscarinic receptors, you can inhibit the cholinesterase enzymes to have a stimulatory effect, okay? So by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down the acetylcholine, you're able to increase the acetylcholine levels in the body. Now there are several different drugs that can be used to do this. Carbamates are the one type of drugs that are used for this. Originally, there's a, uh, a plant from South America called the caliber bean, which was the source of pisostigmine. Uh, now we have other chemical drug analogs for these, and uh, they all work by inhibiting this cholinesterase enzyme. Um, these drugs aren't used very often. Some of them are used in diseases um, where you want to elevate uh, acetylcholine levels in the central nervous system. So in the central nervous system, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's involved with learning, cognition, uh, neuroplasticity, and stuff like that. So it's been used for diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So there's a place for these drugs uh, for dealing with conditions of the central nervous system. Typically, you want to get a drug that crosses a blood-brain barrier and has minimal effects on the periphery. Uh, the side effect profile with these drugs has the potential to be the same as uh, what we saw with the other drugs. So sludge uh, as the mnemonic uh, can occur with these guys. So if you look at, uh, on the left-hand side, there's my little caliber bean, physostigmine. Uh, they inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine and produce the same sort of side effect profile as we saw before with the sludge. Now, just as an aside, there are also certain nerve gases uh, that are used in the Second World War, not mustard gas, but other nerve gases. They basically act as uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. And so some of the organophosphate insecticides like um, parathion and other nerve gases, they're very toxic to humans. And there was a few years ago, 
uh, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago now, uh, there was a terrorist group in Japan that released nerve gas, uh, sarin nerve gas into the subway system of Japan and killed a bunch of people. And uh, the way that these nerve gases cause death is because it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, all that diarrhea, vomiting, tearing, uh, urination, saliva, because you just basically um, you're releasing all your fluids, uh, not only is it one very messy, uh, but two, you're going to die of dehydration, low blood pressure, and not to mention there's going to be some effects on the central nervous system as well. So not a safe thing uh, to be messing around with. So these drugs have potential to cause death if they're not used correctly. Um, in addition to that, we'll talk about the antidote of that momentarily. Um, so, cholinesterase inhibitors, some of the non-carbamate -carb ones, is a different type of drug than the carbamate ones. The carbamate ones just refers to the structure. Uh, Donapezil, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, this is a drug that's used uh, for treating the dementia and Alzheimer's disease because it crosses the blood-brain barrier Again, it inhibits the breakdown of acetylcholine, and it helps with learning and cognition. And the fact that it has a greater affinity in the central nervous system means that hopefully it has less of the side effects associated with it, but they still are there, uh, potentially. Uh, there's a side effects potentially for these as well. Okay. So we've discussed the drugs that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Now we're going to talk about drugs that act as parasympatholytics, which nobody uses that because it's too much of a mouthful, but these are the anticholinergic drugs. And I even mentioned these to you in first year OpMed. Anticholinergic drugs, the archetypal anticholinergic drug is atropine. There's another one called scopolamine, uh, which is important as well, which is uh, also found in nature. Uh, atropine is found primarily in deadly nightshade in Atropa belladonna. And they call, they call it Atropa belladonna. Uh, belladonna means pretty woman in Latin uh, or Spanish or Italian. I don't know what language, one of those Latin languages. <clears throat> and the reason why is that if you take belladonna and you apply it, you take it orally or you apply it topically, what it does is it causes your, uh, your pupils to dilate. And so, as we mentioned before, something that acts as an agonist or turns on the parasympathetic nervous system causes basal constriction while if you block the parasympathetic nervous system it does the opposite effect it causes uh, dil uh, dilation of the pupils and so if you inhibit the parasympathetic system you have a very similar presentation as if you were to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system so I'm going, to rework, I'm going to say that again. So, stimulate the sympathetic nervous system or inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system will have similar effects in the body. And this will be causing the pupils to dilate, increasing cardiac output, increasing uh, um, respiratory function, uh, shutting down digestive function. Uh, so those are the main effects that you have with an anticholinergic, and it's almost identical uh, as um, you'll see with the sympathomimetics. Uh, so some of the plant-derived sources are going to be the atropine and scopolamine uh, are the two classic ones, and they come from um, belladonna, devil's trumpet, or datura, uh, and then a few other things as well. Now there's one particular drug, oxybutynin, uh, we'll talk about momentarily, and it's an anticholinergic used primarily for uh, urinary incontinence would be the main indication for that. And the way that it works is because if you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, you increase your output because you're increasing the output of almost most of the bodily fluids, and by suppressing it, you're going to cause urinary retention. So that's one example. Some other examples. If someone had severe colic, so really severe um, um, cramping pains, uh, you could use it in theory for biliary colic or kidney stones. Um, 
if you needed to dilate the pupil, so if you go to see your ophthalmologist to get your eyes tested and they put drops in your eye, it's going to be some type of anticholinergic, could be atropine. Um, also, uh, you could use it if for some reason the cardiac function was too slow, so you had slow heart rate, bradycardia, or if someone was into like an acute um, uh, some kind of heart block state, you might give it. Uh, they're also used for puffers with people with asthma, COPD, and um, they may be even safer than the ones that act as the adrenergic um, and the beta blockers. Um, uh, sort of the uh, beta agonists used it for uh, for puffers as well. Uh, also, finally, atropine injections are carried by most military personnel because it's the antidote for nerve gas poisoning. So uh, people who are fighting in various wars will have little needles on them that they can inject if they get exposed to nerve gas. Um, and so uh, belladonna, the plant, you could also eat, eat that if you had nerve gas poisoning. So, uh, so if you, where am I out here? Here's a bunch of herbs that are used. You don't need to know that, I don't think. But it's, well, yeah, I think it's good to know that. But you don't need to know that for the exam. Now, the main side effects associated with the anticholinergics is what I've displayed here. So, uh, this little picture here, you've got a little belladonna berry that's bright red. He's wearing sunglasses because it's, it's really bright and his pupils are dilated. And he's in the middle of the desert, and that symbolizes how dry everything is. And so, when you contrast that to what happens when you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, when you inhibit it, it does the opposite. So, uh, when you look at the pilocarpine, for example, there's all this fluid, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, urination, crying, salivation, everything else. In this situation, there's no bodily fluids. So what happens is with your gastrointestinal tract is you get you get a, the first symptoms. Like I've, I've eaten belladonna berries. Uh, if you have about 10 or more, it's, it's toxic and cause death. If you have one or two, first some things that happens, your mouth becomes a little bit dry, um, your pupils will dilate a little bit. That's the main thing. Uh, you also become constipated for you know a couple of days. That was the side effect I discovered accidentally. Uh, it causes a bit of a sore throat because it's dry. Because uh, the effects on the eyes, it causes your pupils to dilate, and as a result, you may find things are too bright. You may have difficulties focusing, so you, you get double vision. Uh, it'll cause urinary retention. Uh, which isn't a desirable side effect. Uh, in, in addition, things like belladonna and jimson weed or datura, they've been used historically in witchcraft and also by some shamans uh, in Central and South America. And also they're found in um, Asia as well. Um, this is not a very safe hallucinogen. The amount of belladonna or jimson weed required to cause hallucinations is very close to the amount that will cause death. So this is not something that you want to dabble and experiment with. Um, it's not a very safe hallucinogen. Uh, not that you necessarily want to be messing around with that stuff anyways. Um, so I don't recommend playing with these very much uh, because they're dangerous. Uh, there was a report a few years ago of a bunch of, I guess, high school kids who read that jimson weed uh, can make you high, so they got it, they grew some and then ate it um, to hallucinate, and then they a bunch of them, I don't know if they all died, but a bunch of them died, and that happened somewhere here in Ontario. So, uh, not really a wise thing. Both jimson weed and deadly nightshade do grow around here. I've seen them in people's gardens. Um, they're quite pretty. Uh, there's a place for them uh, in medicine, but you have to have a lot of respect for these guys. Even shamans in Central and South America, they're not they're not a very uh, well or commonly used plant because they're not safe. And a lot of shamans, uh, from what I've read, won't even play around with them because they're just too dangerous. So they're more likely to use things like ayahuasca or magic mushrooms and things like that. Uh, so that's with the central nervous system. The reason why I'm telling you that is that sometimes people who take these anticholinergic drugs for, let's say, uh, urinary incontinence, uh, 
they discontinue them because they find, I don't know, I got constipated, I had a dry mouth, and I just was feeling all kind of woozy and wonky. And I didn't like I just didn't feel right, and that's because of the effects on the central nervous system. Um, they can affect movement in the body as well, uh, because acetylcholine has a very subtle effect on movement. Dopamine is going to be one of the main neurotransmitters that's going to help regulate uh, movement in the body, uh, but uh, acetylcholine has a secondary effect in there. Um, we, I think we'll talk about a little bit in the central nervous system. And finally, because you're not sweating, uh, what that means is your body can overheat when you're taking these things. And this is why we've got the uh, belladonna berry is bright red. It's really, really dry. And it's in the middle of the desert because it's hot. Okay. Now, another mnemonic, if you don't like my little picture there, is someone else has written this up uh, for anticholinergic, where the main side effects is that it causes you to become hot as a hair, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a wet hen. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, but uh, one of the things that I thought was funny when I first heard that, I was like, what? Matt is a wet hen. What does that mean? I don't, I don't even understand that. Um, and it wasn't until we, were, we had some chickens at my parents' place, and one day I left them out in a really bad thunderstorm. And when I finally remembered, I ran out to let them inside. Uh, the rooster uh, was so angry at me. He attacked me because I left him out in, in the rain. And uh, I got spurred by him, which wasn't very much fun. So now I understand you don't get chickens don't like getting rain, getting rained on. So um, they get very very mad and aggressive. So that's where the uh, um, that line of the mnemonic comes in. Um, so oxybutynin is one drug that's in the anticholinergic class. Uh, it's less potent than atropine. Uh, has better antispasmodic um, activity. Uh, it's used primarily for urinary incontinence, bedwetting, and also hyperhidrosis, which means like people who just have problems with sweating and they just can't control their sweating. Uh, like I mentioned before, significant side effects associated with it. So I don't know very many patients who stay on this long term. They don't like, if anything else, the dry mouth and the constipation seems to be the predominant thing. Uh, and also just some digestive um, disruption. Uh, because it's shutting down digestive function. So these are not particularly useful drugs for long term, but short term for um, as antidotes for poisoning, very effective stuff. Uh, Detrol is another drug that's uh, uh, anticholinergic, uh, used for the same sort of things, just the same drug class, slightly different structure there. Um, not something uh, I'll discuss anymore. Uh, the only other thing I can think of is that there are some drugs that are in addition to being used for urinary incontinence and, and enuresis. Uh, there are some anticholinergics that are used for Parkinson's and some other conditions in the central nervous system we'll talk about later. Um, so there's a bunch of drugs that are anticholinergics. You don't need to know any of that. Uh, so we've discussed the sympathetic nervous system. We talked about the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, I want you to I want you to guys know the agonist and the antagonist for both of those systems. And then finally, we'll talk about the somatic nervous system. Um, as we mentioned before, nicotinic receptors are all are in somatic, parasympathetic, uh, and the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, and so, nicotinic receptors have a profound effect. Uh, on all areas of the nervous system. Um, basically, acetylcholine is the main, recept uh, main neurotransmitter that binds to these, and nicotine, so people who smoke, uh, can also stimulate these receptors. Um, basically, when you take in nicotine into the body or acetylcholine, it causes ligand-gated ion channels to open, causing depolarization of the cells, and at the postganglion, ganglionic nerves, it basically helps to potentiate uh, or transmit the nerve signal. Uh, and when it comes to the skeletal muscles, which is the somatic uh, nervous system, uh, it causes contraction of those. So you can look at that. Basically, acetylcholine or nicotine binds to these nicotinic receptors, and then it causes an influx of uh, sodium. We'll, go through that review that a little bit more uh, when we discuss the 
central nervous system. Um, so the only two things I'm going to talk about here quickly now I, I probably should be talking about smoking cessation in the central nervous system because in addition to affecting the nicotinic receptors and the autonomic nervous system there's also lots of effects in the central nervous system and the effects on the central nervous system is that nicotinic receptors there I don't really know the precise mechanism but it causes a release of dopamine and that's the real reason why people are smoking so dopamine release um, is dopamine is the main neurotransmitter involved in the reward mechanism so when you look at uh, cocaine, uh, gambling, smoking, pornography uh, all the uh, I was gonna say fun things but maybe not fun but all the all the things that people become addicted to uh, that get people into trouble uh, usually involve dopamine. Also sugar, eating a lot of sugar. So all the things that people love to do but they shouldn't be doing that are like the guilty pleasures um, are there's even coffee for that matter. That dopamine release is what's sort of getting the people hooked on it. And so when it comes to smoking cessation there's a few different ways that you can uh, that people can be helped. Uh, one way is your first choice in therapies here is, and this is, I just modified this a little bit, is by taking some kind of nicotine replacement therapy. And this would be either taking Nicorette's, the gum, or actually I probably shouldn't mention um, brand names. Uh, it would be taking some kind of um, uh, nicotine-based gum or an inhaler uh, would be one way, or a nicotine patch. That would be the the main first choice to take. Uh, some of the other first choice therapies would be taking a drug, uh, you may have heard of Champix or uh, Bar uh, Barin, uh, Barin or uh, Nicline. Uh, I've never actually said that word until just right now. I'm obviously not very good at pronouncing things. Um, the way it works is it's a nicotinic receptor partial agonist. So what that means is uh, it binds to nicotine receptors and sort of modulates and has an effect that way. Um, the other drugs involved would be things that inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine, so it elevates that. So uh, bupropion, which is used as an antidepressant, can also be used for smoking cessation because it doesn't target serotonin, but rather it targets the dopamine and norepinephrine to have its effect. And so those are the first line drugs. Uh, the second choice of therapies are related to clonidine. Uh, it kind of helps some of the irritability and, and the anxiety associated with the withdrawal symptoms. Also tricyclic antidepressants. Most of the stuff we're going to talk about later on, the tricyclic antidepressants, uh, the NDRIs, uh, they're going to come up more in the central nervous system. Probably might even make sense to change the order of the lecture, but that's okay. Uh, now when it comes to nicotinic agonists, so drugs that target the nicotine receptors in the body are going to use, be used primarily for smoking cessation, but you also may use them for things like Alzheimer's disease, Tourette's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, uh, perhaps ADHD, maybe ulcerative colitis. Now the problem with nicotine is that when you're taking it um, it might make you feel good short term, but when you discontinue it, you start getting withdrawal symptoms that are related to that uh, depletion in the dopamine. So you start feeling sort of irritable, um, you know, you just unhappy uh, because of the decreased amounts of dopamine. Dopamine's uh, involved with concentration, so you may have poor focus. Uh, because of the decrease on the sympathetic tone, you're going to have general fatigue. Uh, so basically trying to go through drug withdrawal, whether it's cocaine, smoking, or even, even with sugar. It's funny, when I have patients who are doing weight loss with, uh, when they try to stop eating sugar, they have a lot of the same symptom pictures that you'll see with people who are trying to quit smoking. Um, so if you take too much nicotine, um, so if someone's smoking a lot or if someone's doing a lot of chewing a lot of uh, some kind of nicotine replacement therapy, uh, you have the potential to get a lot of these side effects. And if you think about it, 
hopefully none of you have, you have ever smoked before because it's just so bad for you. Uh, but when you look at people when they're smoking for the first time, or if they smoke a lot, you know, a lot of things they describe is that they're out there smoking and they're doing a lot of spitting. So if you chew tobacco or you smoke, you smoke and you spit and people are spitting a lot, and that's because the nicotine is stimulating the, the muscarinic receptors and increasing salivation. The other thing with smoking, though, is if you, under some dosages, if you smoke, you'll spit more. If you smoke different amounts, like in excess, it could actually cause the opposite effect. It actually may cause dry mouth because now it starts working on the sympathetic nervous system as well because it does, nicotine does target the para, parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Also, smoking a little bit might make you feel um, more relaxed, but it can also cause agitation, headaches, dizziness if you smoke too much because you're going from effects on maybe uh, a calming effect to, to overstimulating certain parts of the nervous system. Uh, it can also cause sweating, can cause difficulties breathing not just from the smoke but from the effects on the uh, various receptors in the body, can increase heart rate, can cause arrhythmias, chest pains, uh, and then also as we mentioned the addiction. Uh, so nicotine replacement here uh, this is in a lot of detail here. Uh, it does definitely help people stop quitting. Um, the odds ratio is about 1.66. I won't go into that, but it definitely does help. I think anything, any kind of therapy that can help someone quit smoking is good, uh, whether it's natural or a drug. Um, this is probably one of the easiest things that for people to get access to because it doesn't require a prescription and it does work pretty good. Uh, not everybody likes it. One, although it does get rid of the craving, you don't get the same rush of nicotine uh, and release of dopamine that you get from smoking. So it doesn't, it's not really as much fun as smoking, uh, but it does help get rid of the cravings uh, acutely. Often people will complain that they can get hiccups or some kind of um, stomach ache or a sore throat from it makes them maybe a bit nauseous, gets they get a little bit of um, 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 canker sores in the mouth, might cause a cough. <clears throat> so it also can affect dreams and sleep as well, take too much of it. Applying it topically as a patch can cause irritation to the skin, which isn't good. Now, uh, the nicotinic receptor partial agonists, the way that these guys work, is that it sort of modulates the nicotine receptors and what they find is that this does have better outcomes than doing the nicotine replacement therapies like the nicotine gum or the bupropion which is the NDRI inhibitor. Um, uh, but there are some side effects there with nausea as well, um, can cause some insomnia. Uh, now there are some more serious effects with possible suicidal or homicidal ideations have been reported. Uh, there's some mood and behavioral changes. Um, so when I look at the side effects associated with this, although it might work better than the nicotine gum, um, you're definitely start, you're messing around with some stuff there that I don't think we fully understand that. So yes, it works better, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable with people using this. Not too uncomfortable, just a little bit more uncomfortable. Uh, so I might, if I was a doctor, I may not start people right away, but that would be an option I would consider, but if, if they could quit with the nicotine gum, even better. Um, so that's about it. Those are some examples. When it comes to the NDRIs, the, the norepinephrine dopamine recept, um, uh, reuptake inhibitors, I will be discussing those more in the central nervous system lecture. So I didn't provide a slide here, but um, you'll get that later on. Um, now, more just for fun, we're going to talk about a nicotinic antagonist. So here we got a diagram or an illustration of Socrates. And if you know anything about Socrates, I took a philosophy course at university, um, which was kind of fun. Um, and they basically, Socrates was out there trying to stimulate young people to be critically, uh, to be critical and, and challenge some of the, uh, you know, some of what people were, were teaching. 
And as a result, they basically said, okay, he's causing too, many too much trouble out there, so we better execute him because he's going against what the government wants. And so they executed him. And the way they did that was they gave him uh, a substance that inhibits nicotinic receptors in the body. And that's uh, poison hemlock. And so if you know anything about the story, um, poison hemlock was given. And what poison hemlock does is it contains a substance called conine or conine uh, that basically initially will activate the nicotinic receptors and have a, like a stimulatory effect and then later it has a blocking effect. So if you were to take this, you may say, see a slight stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system followed by uh, a blocking of it. And in the book, um, I forgot what it's called, Plato wrote it, um, slipping my mind right now, uh, basically he describes um, Socrates dying after consuming the uh, poison at Mock and, and it causes a sending paralysis where uh, first in his feet you'll see he starts losing uh, sensation and, and, and develops paralysis and it slowly moves up his body. And once you get up to the chest, if your lungs stop moving, your diaphragm no longer functions properly, then you basically die from respiratory collapse or cardiovascular uh, failure. And so um, that's what happens if you block nicotine receptors in the body. Um, now another example of a drug that does this, uh, oh, and just as a side note, when we'll talk about poison hemlock, if you look at the image on the left hand side, it grows wild, either water hemlock or one of the poison hemlocks, it grows wild around here. And it looks almost identical to things like dill. It's in the same family, uh, the APAC family. So it looks a lot like dill, caraway, uh, wild carrot, uh, fennel, anise. It looks a lot like that. And for someone uh, who didn't know, doesn't know what to look for, you could easily mistake it for a nice culinary herb. Um, and doesn't. I mean, it takes some amount to kill you, but you you got to be careful with it. So, uh, if you're out there picking your own herbs, learn what it looks like because it, it it's out there. Um, now, another drug that's worth knowing about uh, there's a typo uh, in the muscle relaxants is a drug called Curare. Now, Curare originally it was used as a part of a mixture of uh, plants and also some poison frogs were mixed in with some Karari, and it was used in the darts that was used by Central and South American indigenous people for hunting. And so the blow darts, they dipped the, the darts in uh, Karari and, and some other poisonous uh, poisons as well. And what happens is when they hit an animal like a monkey or a bird, it doesn't kill them, it just causes paralysis. So the muscles become weak and the animal basically falls out of the tree and they're able to pick them up. Um, and so with Karari, um, the interesting thing is it causes paralysis, but it doesn't make you unconscious. So the creepy thing is, is that if you were uh, struck by uh, the poison dart, uh, you wouldn't necessarily die. You'd be aware, uh, conscious, and you can feel everything. You just can't do anything about it, which is a bit creepy. So. Um, if you were an animal and they caught you and started skinning you used, and you were alive, you'd be able to feel everything. It would be very kind of unpleasant. So uh, now tubal karari or karari was used in medicine in the past, but they moved away from it. And what they would use it for is when they're performing surgeries, they would give it to patients to immobilize them so they wouldn't move around if you're trying to cut them open or whatever. Uh, so they'd usually combine it with some other kind of drugs, so analgesic drugs, so they couldn't feel the pain. Uh, but the, I guess the sad thing is that if they could feel the pain, they wouldn't be able to communicate to the, to the surgeon, which is scary. Now, um, if you take too much Karari, it can also cause respiratory collapse. Um, and so you probably would have to hook someone up to an artificial ventilator to keep, um, to keep them alive. So I don't think anyone still uses Karari in medicine. Uh, it was used for a period of time, but I don't think it is any longer. But it's nice just to know the, sort of the context of it. Um, and it's now been replaced with drugs that tend to be safer and cause uh, less death, which is always a good thing. So, 
the way it works is it basically blocks the acetylcholine receptors at the uh, on the skeletal muscles of the nicotinic receptors, um, uh, and by blocking it, you no longer allow the sodium to go in to cause the, the uh, muscle cells to depolarize, uh, and therefore it just doesn't contract. So that's the nervous system, autonomic nervous system lecture uh, complete. The main, you don't really have to know, I don't think, you can ask Dr. Lake, I don't think you need to know a lot about the herbs. Um, it's primarily going to be on the drugs and just a few basic questions on it. So I hope that helps you guys out uh, and I will record the lectures for the central nervous system in a few weeks time and the same idea, you'll be able to watch them whenever you want to. So. Um, we'll get those posted for you. So anyways, you guys have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Thanks.